Well, hello and welcome to the CAF people. Hi, Lorraine. How are you today? We've got Lorraine on mute. mute. That's what happens in the CAF. It's that sort of CAF. Uh, I was a little distracted because Joni just oh. rolled on and she wants to join the cafe. Good morning from Montreal. Oh, and how are you, Sam, and your brood? Not bad. It's quite cool. So I'm fairly tolerant of things at the moment. Well, we'll take that as a win this evening down in uh, Metro Manila. Um, Winnie is somewhere around here going crazy, and I'm not going to, up to, to stop her doing that because that's what she wants to do today, which is perfect. So welcome to anybody that's going to the CAF, just to give you a bit of a frame today. Um, we had two previous explorations. First one where we opened the CAF with Sam around Earthlings uh, a couple of months ago. Lorraine then led us in to mining very interestingly recently. And today we're going to talk about reconnecting and what that means to each of us. But let me give you a little bit of a frame as we get going, and then we'll find out what is in each other's cuppa. So today's discussion really is terms such as interdependence, interconnection. They get thrown around an awful lot, particularly by people like me <laughs> at the moment, because I'm super curious. I'm like, wow, these things all join up. That's amazing. But what does that really mean? What are the depths of those connections that we're seeking? And what do we need to do to foster and facilitate the necessary reconnection that can be helpful for ourselves, but also we've got raging global inequities in pretty much every system today. So how does reconnection maybe fit into that? And just give you a bit of a frame. One very personal example for me in the last six months um, was when I learned about, through the kindness of, uh, of Sam and her possible futures crew, I got invited in to learn about the West Papuans people um, and their struggle for liberation and independence um, just to the west of Papua New Guinea. And what was so shocking to me, something I did not join up, but I was not connecting, was the dominance of foreign mining um, companies from the US and Australia that basically, in essence, control, inverted commas, the rights to the mines in West Papua. Now, as I got more curious, with the support of Sam, Lorraine, and others, I started to follow the money, something, a phrase that we use in the CAF semi-regularly, and I realized that my own corporate pension fund, seriously, so I get paid a salary, and I pay some of that into a pension fund for my inverted commas future, has direct links to one of those mining companies that are mining in West Papua. And worse still, and very curiously, the fund in which I invest, there are only two that are inverted commas ethical out of 88 funds. So if I want to be a super conscious human being in the West, trying to do my bit, trying to reduce those inequities, I'm going to try and find an ethical fund, right? I'm sure you'd do the same. But I've only got two out of 88 have ethical, and one of those companies has got a load of mining and oil companies in. So maybe there's another cafe sometime about what ethical means. But back to this one for today, um, just as I wrap up the intro. So whilst I've been increasingly reconnecting to myself and others over the last seven years, what's, what's been woefully disconnected for me is actually what's happening today in 2022. Yes, there are critical issues. We see it in Ukraine and Russia and all around the world. But you've got situations like this in West Papua, which have been going on for over 60 years, but we don't even talk about it. So my role in the chemicals industry, the financial markets, sustainability, Inc., as we talk about, you know, how are we going to use this reconnection to truly better understand and sense into what needs to change? So here we are. We are here to talk about reconnecting today in the CAF. So as we get going, I'm going to go first because I'm boring with my drinks, Lorraine and Sam, and I'm still stuck, although in a recycled capacity, with water in a pot. So over to you, Sam. What is your beverage of the day? I am drinking a turmeric tea with fresh ginger in it. Ooh. And yourself, Lorraine? I've got my uh, fair trade shade grown Ethiopian dark coffee with some local cream I'm back into uh, full cream these days <clears throat> in a pottery cup made by my sister. 
That is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So last time we had Sam, what was the name of that amazing handmade vessel that you shared with us last time? I don't remember. <laughs> I'll have to turn it upside down. There's there's tea in it, Gary. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. No health and safety today, please. No health and safety today. Okay. So let's get on. So welcome to the cafe, everyone, again. Thanks for bearing with the intro. Um, so we have Lorraine, Sam, and I here. And we're going to explore reconnecting through two key questions. And let's start with the first one, which is, what do we individually, and of course collectively, but what do we each in the CAF today, what do we feel the main sources of disconnection are that you observe within your context that are most impacting climate and societal breakdown as you see it today. And let's go to yourself, Sam, if you don't mind, as it's, uh, you've been up the longest today out of all of us. So I'm gonna defer to you in this first question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so firstly, what you already pointed to so far, Gary, I just want to kind of wrap that up in a summary one sentence, we are actually very comfortable with the systems of violence that provide us comfort. We're comfortable that they exist. We're comfortable that companies who perpetuate them are doing really well. And we're totally comfortable that it's people who are not white who have to suffer the consequences. We're totally 100% comfortable with that as a global human society. So this for me is the main source of disconnect. And this culture that allows us, that gives permission for us to be comfortable comes from, I think, the corrupted lenses of histories that we are, we've been taught and that we're kind of blocked from knowing, you know, our real actual histories. And this is because of generations of propaganda by colonial hegemony. The folk who control the microphone control literally your thoughts, right? There's enough science fiction books written about this, so I don't have to explain that. But when it happens over millennia, or in this case, like since, let's say, uh, the start of the colonial period, centuries, then we're talking about intergenerational cultural evolution that takes us away from knowing our histories. So some people call this erasure, for example. So separating us from our knowledge of who we actually are, of you know the stories that, that we can tell ourselves to, to say like, this is who we are, and we're very clear about that, and we can be in that identity, etc. Uh, we have to adopt um, other stories that other people tell of us. For example, in order to put themselves in a different position of status and power. So we don't really know what our real lived diverse histories are anymore, or it's very rare that you meet people who do understand this. Um, and this has resulted in a multi-generational failure that really shows up as an intergenerational trauma. This is how millennials particularly are experiencing it. You know, they name it as an intergenerational trauma. They feel it in the way that their parents well, the way that their grandparents treated their parents and the way that their parents treat them and the way now they get to choose how they would like to raise their own children. So there's a there's a, a really felt sense that something has been very wrong for a very long time. And with my child, I'm going to try to do something different. This is kind of where that feeling tends to come up uh, for the millennial generation. So where does this show up, right? You know, this disconnect, it shows up in the form of patriarchy, normalized patriarchy. It shows up in the form of normalized white supremacy, of late stage capitalism, of co-opted religions and misappropriated cultures, of hierarchical control allowed to perpetuate through the staunch upholding, as I said, of the concept and belief even of the nation state. <laughs> How we are so readily identifying ourselves as I am from a nation state, right? So there's various levels here and I'm not gonna go too deeply into them, but one of my pieces called 2030, The Ends of Worlds, point to two particular um, ways to think about modernity. 
So I call it modernity with a capital M and a modernity with a small M. So the big M is the one that is branded by coloniality, essentially. And this is the one that is kind of more popular. People like to talk about, you know, the European Renaissance and how it kind of emerged with this like Western uh, supremacy uh, version of modernity that prioritized modern science, technology, nation states, uh, money, economy, capitalism, industrialism, etc. So this is the post-traditional way of being, basically, or post-medieval uh, is what they call it in Europe. And this a lot of it centers around Cartesian philosophies of the, basically, dualism, which has actually very well been debunked. But that's kind of the reference that comes up a lot uh, from that version of modernity. The small m modernity, however, I also want to bring up is much deeper, I think, in our psychological history, our cultural evolution, because I think that this is a modernity that came about with the separation of civilization. So what civilization did, for example, is take us out of our ecosystem. Suddenly, we no longer see ourselves as part of nature's complex ecosystems, but we see ourselves as part of, you know, somewhere in the hierarchy of a civilization or a city-state because basically of the way that agricultural surplus is able to allow us to do things apart from farming. So these layers of separation, I think I just wanted to point to this, this mode of evolution that it's not just, you know, you're born today and then you have these, you know, some layers of separation appear in your childhood. No, this is not the case. This has been going on for thousands and thousands of years and it particularly accelerated in the last 600 years of our colonial and so-called post-colonial period on this planet. So coming back to millennials about how we understand this because we feel it, it feels like a very kind of weird weight to hold because some people really understand it from a, a socioeconomic perspective, from the basis of, you know, this is the kind of life that my grandfather could expect to have, this is the kind of life my father could expect to have, and this is how it feels for me. But many are also starting to feel this disconnect in terms of, I have no tradition, I have no culture, is that a problem? How can I refine that, etc. So this really talks, goes back a little bit more of the way but there's much fewer people and there's a, a big danger of co-optation who are trying to understand, okay, can I go back to some kind of indigenous culture, right? And so you'll see like a lot of eco-village trends, for example, permaculturists trying to, you know, very, very crudely stumble into some form of iteration or experimentation with this kind of going back the way. But in all of these cases, the objective, I think, is the same. It is to try to address intergenerational trauma on multiple levels. Um, so I just wanted to point this out as a small seed of cultural regeneration, which is going to be very diverse and very local. But it is there, and it's growing, and we're doing it very badly at the moment. Thank you, Sam. As always, Super informative and blows my brain whenever I hear Sam speak. Thank you for that, Sam. Lorraine, love to hear your thoughts. Sure. And Sam, you've given a lot to build on there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, it, it kind of sparks two branches for me. And one really builds on what you talked about in terms of comfort, which I really think is so key to the disconnect, ironically. Um, and then the other is this notion of permission. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. But just before I go there, I, I wanted to reinforce something that you said, Sam, around um, education and erasure. And you just caused a flashback. You know, it is kind of early in my day here, so I'm still partly in that dream state um, of my high school modern Western Civ class, <clears throat> modern Western civilization. I mean, it's even called modern Western civilization. And the whole course, and I was in this like gifted program and it was, you know, considered a very, um, very excellent education. We had the best teachers put into this program. It was, it was amazing in many ways, like in all kinds of ways. It was a fantastic experience, except for what we learned. Um, and it literally began with Descartes. 
and built from there. And I remember it like it was yesterday. There were a lot of really formative uh, concepts sort of fed to us. And it's been cycling back into my mind of late, just almost as references like, oh, that's why this seems normal, you know? And, you know, is there such thing as China? Is there such thing as Africa? Is there such thing as any other part of the world in terms of cultural relevance, knowledge, history, etc.? No, <laughs> you, you know, Europe modernized us and got us to be civilized. So anyways, um, I am a result of that and I'm slowly noticing and doing what I can to sort of unlearn, relearn, try again. And two factors really come up for me again. So comfort and permission, and I'll explain a bit more. When you talk about comfort, it really resonates deeply when you describe that, you know, we're comfortable with the circumstances of essentially mass suffering being a requirement of my comfort. <clears throat> There's lots we could unpack there. And I think you set the stage really clearly when I think about it going forward, it's not only unacceptable the way it's kind of constructed right now, it's encouraged. So for example, if I would like to improve my life, let's say, like if I'm striving for the relatively common and incentivized things for which I might strive, let's say a bigger home or more, um, more comforts, in my life, I'm going to amplify that trend, even investing so-called ethically so that I can have more money in retirement, even um, purchasing in a way that is so-called, you know, and I was sort of tongue in cheek when I said my uh, coffee was shade grown and fair trade. I'm aware of the <clears throat> fallacy of some of what goes on there. So we are comfortable with a highly problematic and destructive paradigm and we're encouraged that in order to be more comfortable physically and emotionally and financially and, and spiritually, we amplify that circumstance instead of recognizing it and taking it apart because that's actually very disruptive and, and frankly quite uncomfortable on a bunch of levels, which leads me over to permission. So one of the things that I've noticed in my work with large companies where I'm doing things like helping them organize and publish their data around environmental and social impacts, I'm helping them with their ESG, environmental, social and governance reporting, strategy, goals, ambitions. And although I'm in many ways stepping out of that as my kind of day-to-day -day work, that's really been a lot of my professional experience over the last 20 years. And one of the things that I can most distinctly recall is the facial expressions on colleagues, so um, project partners or, or clients within the companies. When I use a phrase like, you know, the idea of every industry being a force for healing, there's this kind of like... <laughs> What are you talking about, you know? Um, or the idea that we look at business models in ways that might serve life versus reducing harm or kind of keeping track of how much trouble is happening, whether it's pollution or human rights violations, et cetera. And what I find so striking about that is that the majority of people that I've met and certainly within business, making business decisions, deciding how budgets are allocated and setting goals, et cetera, haven't even pondered, haven't even considered the possibility that industrial norms can and should be life norms. You know, they can and should deliver on what humans and, and other members of the very complex interconnected biosphere would actually need or want. And so even just giving oneself permission to contemplate that as a possibility, not with that Pollyanna rose colored glasses, like, oh, we could make all business really regenerative, <clears throat> but actually like, well, wait, shouldn't it be that by definition? Shouldn't that just be the way the economy works? Why doesn't it work that way? Which circles us back to a lot of the foundational points you just raised, Sam. So where I'm hovering when I think about the disconnect 
and the reconnecting in myself and sort of noticing others around me is how to recognize truthfully that comfort that comes from some pretty uncomfortable truths and then how to give myself permission to imagine alternatives, not in a Pollyanna rose colored way, but in a sort of welcoming of meaningful disruption way. And when I do that, I feel more discomfort, more um, sort of trouble, but the potential for connection feels higher. I feel more like a, a reality within myself versus a, I'm just going to keep going, even though I don't think this makes sense. So that's where I'm at with connection, still a long way to go, um, but an awareness that that is, I have an appetite for it and I'm noticing it around me. Wow. Well, I'm having a big old torso back of neck reaction as you shared there, Lorraine, just like, oh my God. Um, because it's, it's, it's the we for me, as I share what comes up for me with this, this question. And I really appreciate both of you speaking to that comfort piece because the thing I'm observing as, as, as people that may be watching us live or watching this back know, I work in corporate still, a big, hairy, three and a half billion turnover corporate, not a small baby. So really, really a, a product of this conversation, right, over many, many generations. And what I observe is definitely that comfort piece. And I see it in, in I, to name in, from my worldview, you know, I sit with this comfort all around me going like, what do I, what can I do from here? Like, who am I? You know, we have those sort of comfortable reflections because I can sit here and introspect and think about, yeah, the world could be better. What can I do from where I am? But like, but what's the, what's the push, right? What's going to push me and many others to truly step into reimagining as you're speaking about, Lorraine? And I think that's a big part of this disconnection is, and what I've certainly, my own journey has been in the last few years has been, no, I'm worthy. Actually, as a human being, I am worthy before the money, before the job title, before the education accomplishment. And we've been so conditioned, again, supremacist patterns, right? You will be okay when. Like, and that is so deep in our culture in the West. You will be okay when, Gary, you've got the job, when you've got the salary. But until then, you keep doing exactly what you've been told because until then, you're not worthy. So we've got this really interesting sort of, Oh, it's more than a seesaw. Of course, it's always spirals. But there's just this, what I observe in the workplace, but also outside and in myself is this, there's way more awareness of the disconnection within ourselves. I see it in my own company. I, I'm shocked, actually, Sam and Lorraine, how many people know exactly where we are. But because of that comfort, it's almost like a, sorry for any trigger warnings, but this is serious stuff, right? It's almost like a comfortable suicide. It's like, actually, I know exactly what's going on, but I'm just going to keep going with it because it's more comfortable to die that way than to actually have to fight for my land as someone tries to grab it. So it's this really, it's a strange tension. And we'll speak to our ideas, how we might be able to invite people into this sort of going forward. But that for me is a big factor. It's this sort of comfortable suicide. And I know it's a strange phrase, but it's really coming up powerfully and I've really wrestled with it of this, you know, what's, and we've had conversations, Sam and Lorraine before, like what's the, is there a certain amount of pain that a human being, a big CEO of an oil company or a government leader or, you know, an agricultural you know, CEO, you know, what does that person need to experience in their worldview to shift them to think or imagine differently? And is, in this reconnecting part of that is one of the questions I'm taking through our discussion today. So that's, I think this comfort part, part is a really common theme, is like, how do we, and I think, Lorraine, like back to your point for me is, I've not felt, I'm speaking as I, as Gary, I've never felt more alive as a whole human than I do now, as terrifying as it looks on the outside world, as, as how much is going on, as tragic as it is, as scary, inverted commas, as it is, I've never felt more alive and connected. So there's something in that as well, right? That actually, do you want to commit collective suicide, being comfortable whilst you know what's happening? Or is it actually better to be a little bit more alive, a bit more connected to you, those around you, understand the systems, even if you don't really know what you're doing one day to the next? And I'm massive work in progress with all of that. 
So that's sort of where I'm at with this, is this... I'm looking forward to listening to us back, you know, because I've got no idea what I just said, but it felt very true. <laughs> yeah, so um, before we go to the next question, any, any, has anybody else got anything else popping up for them, um, emerging? Maybe Sam's got something that's popped up for you. Uh, Laureen's unmuted, so I'll let her go first. Sorry, thank you. Oh, sure, just something was sparking for me around um, my constant habit of imagining what others could be doing, which I am getting better at allowing to immediately bounce back to, it's not about me convincing others. Any, any sense of like needing to convince the oil company executive is misplaced slackerdom on my part. And, and I mean that with respect because I also think well, we do need to see those changes happen. And I'm not sure how that's going to work. And I know we're going to bounce some ideas around. Uh, but yeah, I was just having that sort of talking about what others need to do needs to quickly circle back to and, and where am I on this? And what are my expectations of myself? Mm, and I wanted to touch upon two things. Um, related to what you both brought up just here. So the first is that Gary mentioned something around, it feels like people are now realizing the systems that we're trapped in, that they're kind of waking up is a phrase that's used a lot. And another phrase that's used a lot is consciousness rising. Uh, so my challenge to that is that we've always been awake. We've always known these things are happening. When you read about anecdotes of how Germans felt as Hitler rose to power, folk know <laughs> what's happening. This, I don't think is, you know, so any system, like during the Atlantic slave trade, folk knew what was happening. But the systems of power, the people with influence, with money, with political backing, etc. They want profit. That's the whole motive here. This is not about morals. This has never been about morals. The only where the only place that morals applies is what Lorraine brought up. And this is the for me around comfort and the fallacy of freedom. So this concept that they sold to you that you are free. We live in a democracy, you're free to choose, you're an individual right? Whereas they are constantly manufacturing propaganda that turns out that actually creates the culture within which you see the world, like you grow, you absorb information, etc. So they create this, this like, enclosure in a zoo for you. And then they tell you that you are free. And then they control everything anyway. And then you, at some point, you get old enough and you realize, hey, I'm in an enclosure in a zoo. And you know what? Everybody in here sees that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, I don't know, protest or something. <laughs> What's going to change? Fuck all. We don't have the keys to the enclosure here. Right? Disney made a bunch of movies about, by the way, animals escaping zoos that might be really great analogies for this piece. But what I'm trying to say is that there are systems of power that no matter how many people are so-called aware or like woke or conscious of all these things, this is not the metric that gets us anywhere. We don't live in a democracy. This is the point, right? This is about systems of power and imposition, how control actually happens and what those with that influence actually think because their worldviews gets imposed on every single one of us through the propaganda that they've been putting out through the centuries. So my reflections on, on this is really about what are we conscious of? You know, because is this another thing that they're trying to sell us that, oh, people are woke now, so therefore things are going to change. So don't, you know, just hang on, don't worry. It's going to be okay. <laughs> we got this, BLM. <laughs> 
Thank you both. Really, really, really interesting. And it's, I was reading an article earlier on LinkedIn, actually, um, of all places, talking about self-help books. And it was just quite hilarious. They were talking about the, yeah, it's one example of well-meaning, right? Become more conscious, read a 50 books, blah, 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 blah. All good. That's what you want to do. But what actually shifts? Who knows? Don't know. Next question. So we are now certainly not getting to solutioneering, but we are imagining what would happen? What would our ideas be? Two, let's stick with the power topic, Sam. I think that's really important, right? Fundamentally, that is what we're talking about, is how do we, how do people, will they ever want to decentralize or give away or set up a structure or systems where we see a more equitable distribution of power? So we're going to have a bit of fun now for the second half of our calf today. I hope you've both still got enough in your cups. Yeah, just about. Might need a refill. No, we've got a couple of thumbs up. Good, good. So we're going to go for a little bit of fun. And we're just going to imagine here that we, the three of us, but also you, and please feel free. We're not going to interact today. But if you want to drop a comment in the chat, we'll come back to it. And maybe you're going to put some extra seeds in some further cafe chats. We'd really appreciate that. So let's say we're organizing a, a, a Lorraine, Sam, Gary, and all of you out there. We're looking to organize a conference for a range of executives, um, shareholders, boards, and I'm gonna bring it really close to home, of chemical industry companies, right? So big global multinationals, really in the, the absolute bang heart of the global supply chain, and maybe that propaganda that Sam is speaking about. Um, in fact, definitely, if we look at oil from back in 1970s, but we'll carry on from that one today. Um, <laughs> I was being too, too kind there, wasn't I, Sam and uh, Lorraine? Um, so we've got all of these powerful people in a space. Somehow they've come to the chemicals Davos, but we're going to go to like Lake Garda in Italy instead of Davos in the Switzerland for a change. What would we do? What would we want to facilitate? What would we want to hold space for to allow for a reimagining of a new way of the chemicals industry and what power may look like within that? So who would like to chip in first? I don't mind going, but Sam or Lorraine, does anybody feel particularly moved to go first? I'd like to hear you first. And I'd like to hear if there are particular people, actually, that you think would begin to lean in to what you'd like to, to offer. Interesting. So for me, I'm going to go with a little hashtag I use sometimes. Change is an inside job, one word. Now, why I'm starting there, Sam, is partly because it's been my own journey the last seven years, but because that's where I see a lot of the disconnection today is I see if I look around at top of the chemical industry, oil, gas, government, don't know where you look, right? We just see the, the collapse, well, the, the expansion of the human ego at the same time as everything else is collapsing, right? It's just almost like you've got this valve and it's just being so compressed by the ego and it's just going, ah! And I believe that one of the things I would want to bring into this space is an, an opportunity for these execs, these senior leaders, A, to stop, like absolutely just stop. Stop looking at the metric, stop looking at growth, stop looking at merging acquisition. You've got three days where you are not allowed to look at your phone or your laptop. That's the first part of the design. Complete switch off, right? Literal cold turkey from all of your technology, your numbers, your metrics. What about the radio? <laughs> maybe, the, maybe the wireless. I don't know. We'll see. That's part of our co-design. We'll Morse just... code? <laughs> Morse code. <laughs> to be honest, I'd make way more sense with that technology, honestly. Um, but that's where I would start, Sam, to be honest. We genuinely would like, how do you get people how do you get these senior leaders with this power and decision making control as is inverted commas to come into a space together importantly across sector across function so not just one not just chemicals actually how do you bring the up and down supply chain how do you bring the global supply chain into that Maersk how do you bring the pharmaceutical companies in the agrochemical companies in how do you bring in the energy companies so it's really a truly diverse mix of these execs into a co-created space with the three of us. And we start with no technology. And so how does that feel for you? Let's go around the room. 
Boom. First step. I just want to make sure we don't lose the other part of Sam's question that was in there, which is, are there particular people or particular players? So I'm seeing the kind of general picture, but are there specifics in there? Also, so, I'm going to add, so yeah. you're proposing to facilitate connection through disconnecting them. <laughs> through connecting them to themselves is the priority. So yes, absolutely. That is part of the proposal. And thank you for capturing the other part of the question, Lorraine, from, from Sam. So for me, from what I've, what I'm, as, as I've joined a few more dots the last few years, I think what's particularly important is big oil and energy and the renewables, of course, movement and what future energy may look like. So that whole energy piece is critical. And I would say also the agrochemical CEOs in particular and the pharma CEOs in particular. So if you're only allowed to have a smaller subset that you could grab maybe as an experiment, so let's call it version one MVP, it would be the big energy, top brass, as is, because you know it's a dying system or this top down hierarchy, but it's where we are now. How do we get those people into a space to experience connection to each other from the inside out without all the technology and all the noise? So that would be the initial idea from my side would be that how do we connect to one another as senior people without trying to beat each other up trying to take each other over trying to win market share from one another just as human beings without all of the masks and what do we understand about ourselves and one another in that space that would be the initial start for me okay so i'll do a yes and perfect so okay. yes we disconnect them from communication devices and lock them all in a room. <laughs> Sounds like we've just kidnapped a bunch of execs, Gary. <laughs> so what do we do apart from, well, in addition to writing ransom notes to their families? So the first I would say is that when the disconnection happens, so I'm trying to imagine, I don't know these people obviously, but I'm trying to imagine, so when the disconnect happens, what happens, right? So they they suddenly are face-to-face -face with their this like tsunami of fear and insecurity. And they're surrounded by other people who are experiencing the same thing right now. Just this huge wave that just kind of, probably within the first 10 minutes of, you know, leave your phones at the door, etc 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 and then probably some people will get heart attacks so we need to definitely have first aid like paramedic like a lot of paramedics like in the room because i'm thinking like folk will not be able to breathe we also need to obviously pump up the hvac system to actually get proper fresh air in here but we'll talk about the technical details later on um so how do we like facilitate that like how do we like there's this is a crisis situation right now right this is ground zero like how do we get people to stability from that point because it's this is really like you know this is worse than vipassana you know not only are do you have to be in silence or be disconnected you have to be disconnected with all these people who experience the same like fears and insecurities as you do right so I don't know. I think we should put on like the Lego movie or something, you know, like just to distract them a little bit, not too much, but, you know, just something to have in the background. That's kind of where I would start. Okay, I'm going to yes and on this one. After the Lego movie, <clears throat> I think we then show two other movies. And they're short, uh, maybe <clears throat> eight minuteers. And the first one is a movie that is beautiful. So the visuals are very sort of aesthetically elegant and life affirming. And it's a movie about human, uh, the, the elegance of the human body and how it works and how sort of self self healing and resilient and dynamic the body is. So how, <clears throat> essentially how 
digestion works, right? We let this outside world into us, this stuff called food, and it flows through this amazing tube that we call our digestive tract and it becomes us and we carry on and we do amazing things. And showing how literally how that works at a kind of cellular and cell wall level, but then also at a wider level, like a human thriving, being healthy, perhaps a range of humans to bring the diversity into the room ages, ethnic backgrounds, uh, activities, etc. And then the next film is, um, instead of being at the human individual scale, it's at a kind of more macro scale, but again, it's aesthetically beautiful. It's um, highlighting the elegance of thriving dynamic systems. So say, um, going into the Atlantic forest or a coral reef or, you know, and again, maybe a diversity of systems where we, we kind of follow at a cellular and then kind of multi-cell and, and wider system level, how it works because it works and it's incredibly resilient and self-healing and, and dynamic. And so we've kind of just given a snapshot, which many of these people, most people simply don't have, like, how does life actually work? Like, how does it take stuff in, process it, and then turn it into its new, thriving, evolving, growing self? And then maybe there's an intermission, maybe they have time to like top up their coffees or chat amongst themselves. And then we show another film. Or maybe it's a maybe it's a conversation. I'm not sure the medium. Um, and this one allows them to highlight how their products and industry and services and interaction with the economic universe that they are currently commanding. All that on the same day? Oh, yeah. Day one? Oh, my God. That's a roller coaster. Okay. Morning one. It shows them how their products intersect with these systems. So for example, Gary, if you've got the big food inputs from the chemicals industry showing, okay, remember those thriving human bodies we just saw? Let's go into what happens when they eat the monocrop GMO pesticide laden grains that serve as essentially toxins and inflammatory foods through their body and their immune system. Oh, okay, it looks like this. And then let's go to that second video where we saw those ecosystems, but now let's look at what happens when those chemicals flow through those ecosystems. And doing it in a very simplistic, elegant, again, like clear, visually comprehensible and accessible manner. And then opening the discussion for, so, you know, which part of that <clears throat> would you like to keep doing? I don't know. That's kind of where, where my mind goes. Maybe that's overly simplistic. I actually think it's brilliant. Like, I love the use of the word elegance as well. And I think it's, I realize, as somebody that does facilitation, I've realized how horrible I've, I've gone like, no, you don't need 12 step CEOs. You've got one step, get in here. Here's the room. We're gonna lock. But, but, but I'm sitting in this thing genuinely because I, I just know how much, how valuable something like that genuinely would be and the impact of what it would be. But then you go back to the connection, disconnection piece at the front end. How do you even get these people to be open enough? Bearing in mind all of those fears that will absolutely flow out. Like, so what's, you know, what's that, you know, what's the disconnect? And again, it's hyper hypotheticals here, but I'm really curious about what are the questions maybe we need to ask or what is the media that needs to be put out to counter the propaganda to say, hey, there is actually this other way. Right. And actually, you're invited in because, again, you are human. You've got a family. You're just trying to survive in your context. You just happen to have a boatload of power more than most people. So, so dim direction. But, Sam, do you have something to add there? Well, we don't have to. We've clearly hired mercenaries to put them all in the same room and lock the door. <laughs> we don't really even need to sell tickets because we have ransom notes out to their families. So, I'm not sure why you're worried about that. I think we have the upper hand here. Um, but I would like to know, so Lorraine's just laid out morning one. What's afternoon one for you? For me. For either you or Gary, or maybe Gary, because like he, he needs to move the program along here. 
Yeah, what do we do, Gary? I, I got the morning dub. You got you got to pick it up from here. I need a break. I think three hours of yoga will probably do nicely. <laughs> um, joking apart, I'm really curious. I actually think there would be an envisioning session in the afternoon. So actually, based on what you've done, go and have a nice lunch. Go and actually come back and start, get to know, you know, meet these people. Because, you know, part of this as well, I think, Lorraine and Sam, is around, I genuinely, apart from going to a conference and seeing each other as competitors, I don't think they will ever have had a conversation like this. Like, actually, without every single mask or at least a number of masks being layered up, I can almost guarantee it. So actually, to allow that mingling, as it were, for a couple of hours over lunch and in between, like that's part of the design, right? And actually start to go, right, okay, so what popped up for you over the last couple of hours? That would actually be a worthwhile endeavor in that afternoon, first part of the afternoon. What popped up? Like, what's landing with you? What's not making much sense? Like, let's give some space to start to express. Because through expression, I believe, comes connection or reconnection. If we start to express and hear stuff coming through ourselves, then we start to join dots with others. And it's like, okay, there starts to become this connective tissue that's potentially there. So that would be my initial next step, sort of post-lunch. Is Okay, so what did you, what came up for you? What made sense this morning? What didn't? Anything afresh come up? You know, what ideas do you have actually following this morning? So I think as, then you start to hold the space for the exploration that afternoon, I think, and start then to, yeah, really use that what's coming up for them as the, as the seed for what you start to do for the rest of that, that afternoon. That would be my proposal. Lorraine, anything else you'd build out or challenge around that? Yeah, well, one thing I'm envisioning is that there will probably be a couple categories of reaction um, in that, you know, although we're talking about a group of people, they won't all be responding in the same way. And in particular, when I think, I don't know these particular individuals, but when I think of the executives that I've had a chance to interact with in a somewhat similar setting, not the same thing, um, the let's just say the vibe isn't exactly like spiritual openness <laughs> um so how do we cultivate that and what i wonder about doing is a little bit of dividing and conquering so i'm just thinking out loud here but somehow creating the circumstances to notice who is actually like getting it able to not be totally ego oriented and like, yeah, but we got to be realistic. And, you know, it's still going to come down to quarterly returns. Like let those people self sort into the, okay, we'll deal with you later. Cause you're not helping and let those rise forward or kind of separate um, who are like, huh? Yeah. The time has come, you know, I've been, this has been brewing and I can feel it or some, you know, they're sort of standing forward how to empower their voices to come up a little bit more. So I'm thinking about maybe like <clears throat> little breakouts or um, little kind of side quiet conversations. So it isn't dominated, like there isn't a kind of speaker listener of the, the whole room. And then let those individuals start to shape and demonstrate in, in new and different ways. And somehow, I, I think we need to, to imagine ways to really truthfully call out, like back to what you said right off the top, Sam, about, you know, we're comfortable with really atrocious things. And I think we have to find a way to, to be genuinely truthful about that without humiliating or denigrating, even though that's tempting, that kind of gotcha vibe, um, because that doesn't move things forward in those contexts. So some way to say like, yeah, you guys have benefited from it. So have we, by the way, and we're not here to destroy you, but we are here to stop this. And so I'm trying to think of ways to create the conditions for that. I think it's breakouts. I think it's letting some of the more advanced, ready voices surface while the others kind of quietly simper in a corner. <clears throat> yeah, more to plan there for sure. <clears throat> Actually, just one more quick thing too. I think because this is a three-day event, 
we want to take advantage of the sleep and what happens when people sleep and what changes with ideas that you have in your mind before you sleep and what you can do with them after. Again, again, just thinking out loud there. That's I got it. this. Yeah, I go got this. It. I got evening one. Okay, so after all that, then we have a choice of three games that they can play. So we set up the conference hall to play three different games. First one is hide and seek. Second one is a Mr. Potato Head tea party. The third one is Minecraft. And then we have dinner. I don't have any idea what dinner could be, but then immediately after dinner, manicures and pedicures, and then showers, bubble baths for everyone. Change into fleecy onesies. Um, and then you can choose your own sleeping bags and they're all cartoons from Cartoon Network in the 90s. And then you can pick your spot on the conference hall. You can, you know, create your own little nook with your friends, whatever it is, and then lights out. Then you sleep for eight hours and then you wake up and then day two. Okay. Here's where we are. Day two morning. Everyone's in their onesies, brushing their teeth. <laughs> I love, I love the, do you know something? what a fun image. I just love that image. <laughs> Why not? Oh dear. I love it. Do you know what's really interesting for me? Like we're at day one, right? It's another two days to go. I'm conscious of time. We've only got five minutes left. If anybody's out there watching this live, like generally, and by the way, I'm connected to a number of you chemical industry leaders. I'm really curious how this is landing. Um, but it's, the, the thing that's curious for me is that the, the ability to go like to look at these topics in the face, I think back to that getting this uncomfortable, but knowing, as you say, Lorraine, like no one's out to try and shame anybody. Right. It's like, actually what, like how can we do something to, to, <laughs> to try and pull the handbrake on? Right. Like how do we do something collectively and pretty bloody quickly? Um, and I'm, I'm really giggling. Like, for what is like a really, really important topic, I've got no, no, no more of an image than all of the chemical execs in the 90s um, sleeping bags. So I think we're just going to go to check out for now. We can come back and do maybe day two and day, day three another time. But um, obviously, I'm proper giggling. Lorraine, I would love for you, if you would not mind, to share a few thoughts as you check out today. And thank you again for joining the CAF. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate the conversation. And I'm sitting with this notion of comfort, <clears throat> for sure. What it means, how it feels, when it's genuinely comforting versus sort of soothing in, in a troubled way. And uh, just going into the morning with everybody in their onesies, brushing their teeth for a second, what I'm realizing is, um, as these are all individuals with lives and pasts and futures, and there will also be, as there always are with humans, a lot of addictions and a lot of behaviors that need uh, to be expressed, either openly or not. And I'm thinking about the kinds of addictions that we sort of propagate and culturally normalize to be comfortable and how those addictions, uh, some are very taboo and, you know, have whole industries built around trying to, you know, break them. Um, and others are just, <laughs> there's industries built around propagating them, sometimes all at the same time. Um, so I'm just thinking about that role of addiction and self-soothing and trying to seek comfort in ways that are harmful versus genuinely looking after myself and others in ways that are comfortable because they're good, because they're elegant, because they propagate the conditions that enable life to thrive. So that's sort of sitting as a question as I'm picturing all these folks in their onesies and wondering like how many of them are hungover or wishing they could get their hands on what they really need in that moment that's not a onesie and a toothbrush. Um, and I don't know the answer, but I'm glad to hold the question. Thanks for the conversation. Sam, any final thoughts? Yeah, I'm just thinking about logistics. I think this is totally doable, guys. I don't think it would really even take that many people. Like maybe we need uh, three or 400 staff members. Definitely half of them need to be paramedics or people who are trained in you know, security detail. 
Um, and possibly we may also need a mobile morgue. Uh, but I may be taking this too literally in terms of how people deal with the fear and the insecurities. So really just in the space of logistics here right now. Thank you, Sam. And for me, your last comment, Lorraine, actually struck a chord as somebody that I say, I feel this is <laughs> it's a bit weird, but like some of myself that suppressed as a white male emotion for 25 years of my life, that without a doubt requires everything you both described, right? There's going to be therapy required. There's going to be support systems required. And by the way, that is okay. That's my final comment really, as I'm taking is like, actually, do you know something? It's okay to need that stuff. And we will provide it as part of this experience. So no, I'm taking with me that comfort part. And I'm also taking apart this that came out a couple of times, this self-healing. So yes, like how do we allow ourselves, almost how do we give ourselves permission to heal as big industry leaders? Like that's okay as well, right? We're allowed to heal. We're allowed actually to feel better and not get wrapped up in the I'll be okay when. So gone a bit full circle. To connect, we need to get uncomfortable. I'm really clear on that. We need to get uncomfortable, but that you feel don't feel more alive than when you feel connected. So why don't we set this up, Lorraine and Sam, and quick, come on, new idea. Yeah, I'm in logistics mode, Gary. <laughs> I can see it in your eyes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Lorraine. Thanks, Sam. And until the next cafe, don't know what we're going to discuss. Got some ideas, but we will be back at some point soon. Adios, everyone. Take Thanks, care. folks. Ciao, ciao.